Welcome to The Extra Dimension, the show where we explore ways technology intersects with other parts of our lives, which we like to call the technological convergence. I'm your host, Ian R. Buck, and today I am joined by Ian Decker and Mike Sandberg to talk about the philosophical implications of the technological singularity. Find the show notes for this episode of The Extra Dimension at thenexus.tv slash TED31. Hi, I'm Ian Decker, or I'll probably just be referred to as Decker on this show since there's two Ians. Yep. And I'm uh, Mike Sandberg from the Future Jam podcast, and I'll be referring to Ian Buck as Buck and Ian Decker as Decker, so nobody gets confused. <laughs> yes. Yay. Um, and yeah, so the reason that I invited these two particular humans onto the show is uh, because Mike, uh, as he said, has a podcast called The Future Jam, uh, and we have ended up covering a lot of very similar topics over the you know the last like half year, and so we've been kind of like throwing this idea around for a little while of uh, you know hey we should do like you know some sort of team up, um, and the singularity seems like just like the perfect topic to do. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's probably the topic that is most popular if you're a technological nerd is yeah. to talk about the singularity. That's one of the most popular topics. Um, you know, the Matrix and uh, Terminator. It's 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 a popular topic that's been covered. Uh, you know, throughout all pop culture. So it's not a foreign idea, really. Yeah, at, at, right now. Yep. And then the reason that I brought. Ian Decker on is because Ian has uh, helped us out with a lot of our like kind of more philosophical, you know, future facing, like how do these, how do these things impact society kinds of, you know, like big, big thinking questions uh, here on the show. Yeah. Yeah. Like, you know, the, the directed panspermia episode was probably our kind of most like nebulous, you know, what does this mean for the human race kind of, you know, topic so far? By nature, it's something that once we hit there is all guesswork because I mean, the, the definition of the technological singularity is basically when technology accelerates at a rate that's faster than we're able to really comprehend. There's a few different like, you know, ways of of defining the singularity the one that i like to use is um it's the moment in time where we create some technology that uh can design the next best thing right the thing that's better than it uh faster than we can actually design that next best thing right and so at, at that point um humans unaugmented humans are no longer really desirable to use in this process of technological innovation right and so at that point it it you know is a kind of a runaway process of um you know it's it's, it's just going faster than any of us can hope to keep up with um in in our current you know unaugmented forms and uh, by the way if you want to know more about the singularity and kind of the the more hard science the technology how we're going to get there and what what like technologies are going to be possible once we hit the singularity um we're going to be covering that on an episode of the future jam the link to that will be in the show notes of uh, of this episode so go and check that out as well uh to get kind of the full picture of this whole singularity doodad so are we a are we approaching this from a positive angle or a, a a skeptical angle or why not both? If you take a look at the very bottom of our show notes, actually, the last question that I have is, will the singularity be a good thing or a bad thing? So I think we're going to build our way there. All right. That, that makes sense. <laughs> there's, there's a couple of different ways that we can approach it because I know that those have completely differing implications. Like if we approach it as if it's a good thing that we are assuming that technology is going to try and evolve in tandem with us. Um, whereas if we approach it as a bad thing, I mean, worst case scenario is, is that the technology that we create ends up harnessing us in a way that is detrimental to our existence. So like, and both of those outcomes have very different, um, very different consequences in terms of like what will be available to us. Yeah. And I think, I think a lot of that is going to boil down to what actions do we take on our way to the singularity? You know, are we going to like kind of take the proper path in order to, you know, reach the singularity in a way that 
benefits us, you know, and and doesn't put us at too much risk? Uh, or are we just going to like go forward gung ho without, you know, thought to consequences? I mean, that sounds like the human way, by and large, <laughs> unfortunately. Well, you can kind of think of it th- this way is hardware is always ahead of software. Like yeah. software is always behind hardware because they're coming up with better and better hardware implementations and software developers can't keep up with the hardware. So computers were capable of 64 bit processing before the, like a lot of computers just switched to 64 bit software. Like the software Mm. wasn't even Mm -hmm. taking advantage of the hardware. So we, we are advancing at a, at a rate that we almost can't keep up with right now. So say we hit the singularity we're past Maybe we should think of it this way. Like maybe we should we should go talk the good path and talk the bad path and then follow each one and, you know, meet up at the end. I don't know. Sure. Um, Be- yeah. So, so I, I mean, I think, I think there's a, a few neutral things that we could talk about first as well. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah. Sure. So, so like the broad kind of historical trends that we have going on here, um, as you said, like hardware is advancing much, much faster than software. Um, I think the numbers that I've seen is that hardware, like our, our computational um, possibilities with, with raw hardware is doubling every year and a half or so. Uh, and then for software we are we're developing faster you know algorithm implementations and stuff like that every uh six years or so i think is the doubling time which is um quite a bit slower but you know because it's still an exponential curve it's still going to have that runaway effect it just you know won't come to pass you know until later also we should probably acknowledge the fact that like when we're talking about progress we're not just talking about technology itself right in terms of like stuff that we as humans build that is separate from us we're talking about like the entire increase in complexity in the universe right um which has gone from like purely physical interactions right on like before before life existed to life which is this kind of self-organizing self-replicating you know entity that 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 records data in the form of like dna right um and so it it can you know like the the quote-unquote memory of like biological processes is uh you know preserved across generations um but you know like and and so that that like increases complexity much much faster than like purely physical processes do like on you know many orders of magnitude faster um but it's still way way slower than like what we currently have which is us as biological beings creating non-biological technology that is you know like we're, we're we're making our own technology better much much faster than we ourselves are evolving right would you would you say that once we hit the singularity we have to think of it this way that we have basically created a another sentient being and this sentient being is better than us, can process yeah, more information much. than us. And I guess that's what we have to grapple with is the idea that we are basically making humanity 2.0. Mm-hmm. Which also yeah. comes into some of those interesting theological questions of like, if we have then made something with a, uh, well, assuming that with full sentience comes also a soul, because we have made something with the soul, does that sort of in turn make us gods? But that's also just that's just a fun road that we can go down later too. Yeah, and it's and it's a weird, it's a weird thing though because it, like usually when we talk in turn in like religious contexts of like God creating stuff, right? God is always creating stuff that is simpler than God, right? That is that is less, much less than God. Uh, but here in the in the singularity context, right? It's us humans, imperfect humans, creating something that is better than ourselves. It's almost like we're creating a god to rule over us. Like we're creating <laughs> a new god in place of the old god. 
it, it'll be like prokaryotic cells currently trying to understand what multicellular eukaryotic organisms, you know, can do. And, you know, just because evolution went from, you know, developed multicellular organisms uh, doesn't mean that single celled organisms don't exist anymore. Right. Mm -hmm. So like this, like the singularity coming to pass isn't necessarily going to mean that humans are going to stop existing as our biological, you know, unaugmented selves. Um, it you know we, there may be some sort of of coexistence that goes on right you know yeah. we uh as humans we've got mitochondria living inside us mitochondria descended from prokaryotic organisms they've got completely different dna than us right basically everything plays a role everything fits together mm -hmm. and stays around and plays a role in life mm -hmm. yeah yeah and and like and we as humans hardly ever like we don't we don't notice the mitochondria that are inside us you know we are not consciously aware of like here are these things that live inside my body you know we, we've been able to figure out that they're there you know by taking a look through microscopes and stuff um but like you know we we probably wouldn't be able to function nearly as well as we do without mitochondria you mm -hmm. know we like our bodies would have had to come up with some other process to fit the, the needs that the mitochondria provides. So I would say that when we hit the singularity, will the machine have to fit into that order that we have? You know, the, the order we currently have in, on Earth is um, like everything lives, lives in harmony. And how will the machine mm -hmm. fit in to that harmony? Will it bust up the harmony that we currently have? I mean... My my first thought on that regard is just like if we are making them like if if we are the ones that are creating them, you say that everything on earth lives in perfect harmony, but that's only because like a lot of humans have fought against completely destroying things for what would be advantageous to us. Um Yeah, and it also like since all of life on earth kind of co-evolved, right? You know, we've we've um figured out how to live together, you know, without uh I mean, and, and there's there's definitely been entire species that have gone extinct in the yeah, past. Yeah, over you know? millions so it's like, and millions of years, we've all lived together. So we've we've had time to adjust. And this is going to be a probably the quickest change that we've ever had. Like, mankind didn't come to existence with a snap of a finger. So um, the Earth had time to adjust to that. So this is going to be like putting on another... <laughs> Uh, two point like we'd said earlier to humanity 2.0 and just throwing it in to the <laughs> through the to the ring yeah it's um and and it's it's so hard to look back and find comparable examples and know what happened you know because like i've been using the like single celled versus multi-celled organisms right you know it's it's so hard to know like how quickly did that affect the landscape you know as as the organisms that lived inside it understood it right well, you can um, you can kind of like look back and see uh, like when like advanced cultures came in and discovered cultures that are like you know in, in like didn't advance they were they were more like secluded and you can kind mm -hmm. of look at it that way where like how those interacted maybe that's kind of how it would look So there, there's kind of a, a couple of different ways that the singularity might come about, and one of them kind of follows this co-evolving model much more closely, and that model is where we basically use the technologies that we are developing to augment ourselves over time, right? And so instead of it just being like all of a sudden one day, like, you know, we create HAL 9000, which is a, you know, a completely non-biological computer, right? Mm -hmm. We, we kind of slowly, step by step, kind of replace bits of ourselves with technological pieces that we have created that work, you know, better than that, than those pieces. Nanotechnology is going to be, you know, a, a huge uh, piece of that, right? You know, we'll be able to put, you know, tiny little machines into our bodies that can help with, you know, the processes that currently happen in there. So in that way, like, the intelligence that evolves as part of the singularity 
is one that gr- that will grow out of the current human consciousnesses of people who are on Earth. That method really appeals to me as a way forward, partially because it's a much better guarantee that like that that type of thing will result in an entity that will have like our values, which is you know a kind of a silly thing to say because like uh you know as a human society we can hardly ever agree on any values uh but (laughs) you know that seems like it's kind of a rose colored glasses like perspective because like we're we're thinking like humanity is going to be perfect and humanity is going to develop this perfectly and it's going to we're going to have full control and we're never going to lose control and it's going to make us better but I, I don't see that happening because of greed and companies trying to one up each other and countries trying to one up each other. Um, right, right. That's that's like the perfect vision of the future where we don't develop um, computers that are better than ourselves. We de- we co-develop together and, you know. Yeah, it, it, it all depends on where the economic incentives are, you know. Yeah. And what if we get to the point where like – economy isn't really something that we need to worry about to like where if the computers are running everything if technology is running everything we are essentially provided for because we are seen as sort of co-hosts if they are if they are developed and evolve um in a way where they are reliant on us for existence in in terms of like augmenting us Mm -hmm. then i don't see why there wouldn't be a chance for the computers to eventually take over which i mean yes a lot of humans would be scared about because we we get scared about things that we can't control um (laughs) weird how that works but i also know that there would probably be like if they wanted to a machine especially if it passes the turing test uh could probably eventually get to the point where it could end up running everything yeah so that's the idea that's where the idea of universal basic income comes into play because if mankind all the jobs go away because computers and technology can do it better then what will mankind be doing like we um how will we make income yeah so so like in in a singularity context if we still have uh unaugmented humans running around which is likely you know that not everybody's going to want to kind of join in with a, a singularity type you know arrangement um the like the technology that exists is going to have goals that are like so far beyond anything that we're doing and anything that we can like really comprehend i think that it's like it's going to be using like the vast majority of its resources for its own goals whatever they are right you know exploration spreading throughout the universe uh you know like creating ever more efficient computing devices etc you know um that like at, you know any any amount of like food that we need as humans uh you know at like the the resources that it takes to provide entertainment or meaning for us you know is going to be like it'll be negligible uh for whatever other technological entity exists um and so it's like it i i don't think it'll have any reason not to provide for unaugmented humans but also i can't think of any surefire reason that it would have to provide for unaugmented humans you know Mm -hmm. like what motivation would it have either way we're basically meaningless yeah yeah you're pretty much right i guess um because uh you think about it this way um more intelligent beings or more in- not in- more intelligent but more developed or intelligent beings tend to take advantage of or lord over um you know those that you know can't like understand what's going on really right or or they're completely ambivalent towards it you know like we we don't really care about uh the microbiome inside our own bodies except in cases where it is causing us problems, you know, in which case then we do something to like rectify that situation. So I guess just don't bother the machines and let them do, <laughs> let them do their thing and uh, we're fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But the, the thing is, is uh, will, will us 
uh, like uh, using natural resources because we need natural resources to survive. Well, the machines see us using up natural resources as a threat to themselves. Oh, what if uh, Isaac Asimov's those those three rules of robotics were shifted around? <laughs> okay, what what is what is our new version? All right, so it the original are a robot. Ro- sorry, a robot <laughs> may not injure a robot. A robot. <laughs> A robot may not injure a human being or, through an action, allow a human being to come to harm. Rule number two is a robot must obey orders given it by human beings except where such orders would conflict with the first law. Law number three is a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. So then what if that is turned around to where a human may not injure a robot or, being through an action, allow a robot to come to harm? A human must obey orders given it by uh, robots, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. And then a human must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. <laughs> that seems like a, lo- a logical thing that would happen if we become second-class citizens. Which also, I mean, comes to some of the stuff that we'll talk about later in terms of like rights and robot rights and... Yeah. Honestly, uh, do I... we... go for it. Do we want to get into that right now? The robots must have rights. The robots <laughs> must <laughs> have do rights. It. I don't want to defend these guys. They're taking they're taking us over. And we're going to def- give them rights. I mean, they might be taking us over in a hostile way, or they might be taking us over in a beneficial way. We don't know yet. It's true. My my thought is is let's not let's not let's not piss them off as or annoy them as best we can. Yeah. Decker, did you have any thoughts for us to kind of start us off on robotic rights? I mean, this was a lot of the stuff that you had written was our concept of rights is centered around the idea of consciousness, but we can't agree on what consciousness is. Yeah. Um, And that's, oh, that's like a really, really big one for me is that like, um, especially when we're talking about like the concept of a Turing test and stuff, you know, like convincing somebody else that I am a person, right? mm -hmm. Yeah. we, we kind of scoff at the idea of like machines being able to like present themselves as these emotional beings, right? That like, you know, are like they can, they can look like they're having emotions and like they're a person, but you know, are they really having an, any emotions? And like, I could ask the same thing about you, right? I don't know for sure what you are feeling because we all have our own subjective experiences. Uh, and I'm just going to have to trust you that you are, you know, a, a conscious being uh, at the same level as I am. Right. Um, and so it's like on on the one hand, you know, I like the reason that I believe that you are conscious is because I have at least one example right here myself that like a human body can produce consciousness. I believe that. And so I look at you and I go, that's another human body. You know, it, it follows like the same physical scientific processes that like my body does roughly. Uh, and so I kind of believe that like, yeah, you, you probably are conscious as well. Um but like what what's to say that that we couldn't create consciousness through you know uh human made technology absolutely nothing like we are in essence biological machines and the mm-hmm. only reason why we consider ourselves biological is because that is the norm for what we have encountered for life currently so i mean if we just make another thing that essentially functions in the same Around the same capacity, like it achieves the same goals as what we would convince to be or be convinced as life, but ne- not necessarily through the same means. I think that that still counts as life. Um, and so I think that if something is able to think for itself and it has life, then there is consciousness there. Yeah. And, and that's that's kind of the conclusion that I come to as well. I think the, the beginning of this thought process for me was when, were you in my, yeah, you were in my biology HL class in, in high school, right, Ian? Yeah. Yeah. So I remember when Mr. Skinner was telling us that like how neurons worked, each neuron has a bunch of axons and it's receiving inputs from those. And each neuron is basically like programmed with a certain threshold that like if the signal that's coming in exceeds this amount, then I will send a signal on a pulse down my dendrite to the next neuron. And I just looked at Mr. Skinner and I was like, are you telling me? that brains, human brains, our nervous system works 
on a binary level. Like it is a binary system. And he was like, yes. And I was like, holy cow, we are digital. Like I'm a computer. And that was like, that was my first kind of foray into this whole universe of like, like I like we could be emulated essentially. You know, you could mm-hmm. create a computer that is powerful enough to emulate an entire human brain. And at that point, like it's conscious, right? Because mm-hmm. like from the brain's perspective, whether it doesn't matter whether it's in a biological shell or in a non-biological computer, right? Yeah, I guess we could upload our consciousness to a computer, and using that hardware, we could te- technically boost our own capabilities and i guess that would be considered part of the singularity because is all that the singularity is is just using machine does that fit in i think so especially since you know if you if you put it into a computer that's just you know powerful enough to do, do this then that human mind would be running at like in real time yeah. right if we run it on a computer that's faster right then that human mind can go faster as well right they can like think thoughts literally just faster um and so i I would i would definitely characterize that as a form of we've got this runaway you know exponential growth so basically we keep designing computers to make ourselves better yeah okay so i Mm -hmm. guess that would fall into under the umbrella of us evolving alongside with the technology so that's down that yeah. path of we are sta- staying with them and we are uh, developing with the machine language. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And and in that in that scenario, you can have you know like people who used to be biological humans, right? Who have kind of been melded with this this technological state. Um, and at the same time, we can have entities who are, you know, comparable, who have thoughts and emotions and everything and interact with these formerly biological humans on the same, you know, cognitive level. Uh, but, you know, who were not originally biological humans, right? That they were created through some genetic algorithm yeah. or neural net or, you know, a, 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 like they are a pure AI. So would, in this scenario, would we just leave our corporeal bodies behind and no longer even interact in the actual real environment and instead like create our own environments in the digital verse Ooh. because 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 if we actually develop that far we we'd realize like hey why use all the natural resources just leave earth be right like just let it be and we can go on to this basically new earth this new plane and we we can exist in unity that way yeah and it, it all de- hey, existed unity like yeah we're all running on the unity, unity engine <laughs> <laughs> i think i think it really depends on um you know what type of technology we have developed for manipulating physical matter as well you know if we if we like yeah. if we develop far enough where we can like create an entire human body right we could kind of go back and forth right where you've got this this consciousness because that's like all that consciousness is at this point is uh you know like a a persistent pattern so a lot of the research that i did for this episode was uh i read the book the singularity is near by ray kurzweil noted futurist ray kurzweil Mm -hmm. Uh, (laughs) the singularity bible and one of the things that he was talking about was that like if we think about the way that that we treat like digital files that we currently have right all of the media that's on your hard drive you know i i've been around uh on this earth for just barely long enough to have had like files from my childhood that like yeah they were they were stored on a on a computer that was you know using a completely different architecture from you know currently like if i had stored decided to store a whole bunch of my files on floppy disks uh i would i would or zip yeah, drives i would have like a, a a doozy of a time right now actually going and accessing those things um so what i've had to do at every step of the way whenever i want to like change computers or whatever is i have to kind of move my files into whatever new storage format whatever new file formats we're using right and um 
you know, eventually I'll probably find files that I'm like, oh crap, this is like was built for Windows, like Word 97. I, you know, I don't have any software <laughs> that can open it anymore. Because Word, Word's going to be very important <laughs> <laughs> after, after the singularity. Google Docs. The surest thing that guarantees that I will still have the files on hand and still have them in a format that I can open is my own motivation to go and update those files to new formats right you know so when i to the cloud when i switched over <laughs> from uh using microsoft word primarily to using microsoft or what, google docs right i literally took all of the files that i had and like uploaded them to google docs and converted them over and everything and and so like we can kind of take this this line of reasoning and twist it around to think of ourselves as digital files right if we're if we're just conceiving of our own of our own uh, conscious minds as a pattern of of you know information then basically like we can live for as long as we care to keep ourselves around you know well that yeah that's why these guys um the rich and powerful in the tech industry are are wanting this because they they're I, in our hearts, in man's hearts, it, we fear death. And what's driving technology forward right now, and some, well, the reason why some guys are, or people are developing this is because they're afraid of death and they want to get this done before they pass. Yeah. Here's another question is who says that we'll be able to maintain our individuality in that sense? Like if everything is being uploaded. Um, and I'm assuming probably stored on a drive or like some sort of cloud thing. Just imagine for a second, if we are all stored in the same area, who's not to say that the the machines who would have access to all of our consciousnesses, all of the things that make us individually us, won't pick and choose to try and just make sort of some super consciousness? That or delete the ones they think are uh spazzing yeah. out or <laughs> like hey this uh, this does this looks like a corrupted file <laughs> this person creates uh crime which, which isn't too <laughs> far away from how we dealt with like uh mental illness in the 1800s you know we'll just give them a lobotomy that'll solve everything right Obviously. yeah also um if you guys haven't seen it already, Altered Carbon on Netflix is a series that talks about this a little bit. There's a disc that people's consciousnesses are uploaded to that is get that gets placed in um, the base of this, their cervical spine. So that's just like at the base of the neck. Mm -hmm. um, and so they can transfer that disc in between bodies and their bodies will shift, but their consciousness will, res will remain the same. Um, yeah, I thought that was a pretty hmm. unique, I mean, executed yeah. concept. Um, and the more times you do it, the more times you can fragment the, uh, the brain memories and you might not like learn the new body or you might eventually become confused. Um, but that's thinking of, that's like a future where we're still keeping our human forms. Yeah. Um, so th I think that's an in interesting concept of we'll keep our human forms or, or go to something that's more durable and something that's, um, will last a lot longer. I also think that that's like, well, no, there's there's a couple of reasons why that would make sense to keep it like that. One, um, just in the sense of like the reason why sexual reproduction is so important is because there's so many different organisms reproducing all at once that if one, if there's a default in one, um, then the default doesn't doom the entire race. It doesn't do doom the entire species. Do you mean a defect? Defect default. I mean, it's, if if it's technology, <laughs> then default kind of works too, doesn't it? I, yeah, you're right. The default settings are oh, always the worst, right? <laughs> Poop, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, defect. Yeah, you're right. I swear I have intelligent words to say sometimes. Um, <laughs> but like having us maintain that individuality prevents the entire mm -hmm. system from being corrupted if they want to try and move forward. So, like, having maybe something as, like, a general monitoring system uh, for everything, but also maintaining those small bits of pieces and information so that if one thing happens to get shut down, the rest of it can still continue forward. Yeah, and, and 
a lot of times if we have systems that we want to make sure that they don't, you know, get corrupted and fail, you know, but at a single point of failure, right? Currently, what we usually do is we make backups, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so when you think about like in in this kind of system that we're that we're thinking about, it's totally co possible to go and copy, you know, the human brain, uh, the human mind, uh, in order to like make sure that there is, you know, if if we accidentally uh, you know, something happens to one body or, you know, to one hard drive or whatever, um, then like there's still another copy of that person that we can, you know, kind of bring to life. But it's like funny, f funny you mentioned that in that show, um, Decker was talking mm -hmm. about, um, th the richer people had access to cloud backup of mm -hmm. their consciousness. There you go. <laughs> I mean, that yeah. was, um, and they could back it but up. But then like, but, but what's to stop that copy of being run right of being conscious at the same time and so then it, it becomes kind of like who is ian r buck if there's another copy of ian r buck who like you know we we started off at the same point but then once that copy was made right now we're having sep slightly separate uh experiences and you know um I guess there'd have to be a way to stasis lock it, and uh, hopefully that's like set. In or time. is but is that ethical is, though? Because like that other copy is also a fully fledged person, right? Well, I mean, it's I guess. <laughs> I mean that that's sort of what they went with altered carbon is is that that singular disc was the only thing that the person's consciousness existed on. You could back mm -hmm. it up, but then it was just. Then it was just data, and it could be re-downloaded back into the disk. Which, again, yes, I know that um, that means that if you have that amount of data stored somewhere, then that um, that sort of makes that consciousness. But I think it was more so the memories, yeah, of the person. Well, Ian, the idea the idea you were thinking of, um, you would have to constantly keep backing up because you wouldn't want to lose things. Right. So you'd be just constantly just deleting yourself and re-imaging yourself over. And over again. So if even if you did create a another consciousness, um, you just overwrite it the next. So night. that's a that's a great <laughs> example of uh what I you know what I said that with we keep ourselves around, we keep ourselves alive for as long as we care to continue to keep those files updated, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so basically, what you, what we're do what you're doing there is you're deleting a past version of yourself and writing your current version of yourself to that, you know, spot in memory. Um, That's why which you is a current project and a working project for files. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, so, so we're, we're thinking about this as like, we've got a society of individual people who are still fully individual right um and each person has like you know they can have a backup of themselves and stuff like that um, but they're still kind of like this this singular entity um what happens if we kind of meld everybody's consciousnesses together into some you know collective um you know we we we, we make like decisions as a whole by you know come like I, I don't know exactly how this would work but that would be basically making us into a supercomputer or a super um <laughs> creative uh force yeah. uh, so we would be more creative than a supercomputer because computers tend to not have uh creativity. Well, it would just mean that every single bit of data is gets processed by everyone like the if the consciousness mm -hmm. was all loaded up into one big super consciousness, then it'd just be that single piece of data would have to go through at each and every single gate on a person. That doesn't mind. sound very efficient. No. <laughs> yeah, it does. It doesn't. It doesn't. Maybe maybe it would uh, probably look at each and every individual person and lump them into categories of what they're good at and what they're bad at and uh, prioritize tasks by mm -hmm. that. So like this person is definitely not, uh, math uh, numbers driven. So don't throw the, the, but why would we even, why would our brains even be doing this? So we, we have computers to do mm. those types of tasks. Like why would we, why would, why would we even worry about Well, that? I mean, since we're living in a society at this point where the computers are people as well, you know, um, 
I don't think that we can really just go ah to make a computer do it. You know, I'm not going to worry about well, it. Right. Think think about it this way, Ian. We can, we can still live in a society where there's uh, sentient computers and sentient um, humans, but we decide to make a dumber computer to do the oh, task. Oh, sure. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. So we can we can actually we don't have to continue to make computers that are sentient. We could probably make like just work devices, you know, mm-hmm. like devices that aren't as developed as we are. So. I we I think in that society maybe that would probably be the best route to go because we want to free ourselves up to do like more creative things and more meaningful mm-hmm. things and uh, create work bots or work computers that can take care of that behind the scenes stress. I'm thinking about this in terms of like how the human body currently operates, you know, um where we've got all of these individual parts, you know, like I I don't use my head to open a door. I use my hand, right? You know. Well, you you don't want to give yourself another concussion. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, you know, my my hand is is not conscious. It's pretty dumb, right? It just do, does what I tell it to. Um, it's a tool. But at the same time, like, none of my individual neurons are conscious. None of them know what's going on. But as a collective, you know, together, they have this emergent property of consciousness. All right, that's that's fitting together a little bit. So, so then I I think we might be able to take like all of these conscious like things, and when they're all together, what what emergent property is going to come from that? Like, what is? Whoa, guys, is there something beyond consciousness? Is there some like like a next level? The society itself is consciousness. Yeah. Yeah. And- I'm so excited. It's, it's mind blowing. <laughs> <laughs> it's mind blowing. But the thing is, is I, I don't think we can even grasp the like the tip of the iceberg. Oh no, of course like, not. Um, no, because that's the whole idea of the singularity is we can only speculate about it, but it's it's unfathomable by our minds. Like our minds can't even handle like what it could technically be. Mm-hmm. So that's why it's so cool to talk about because we can speculate on all these things and. And we're not even like uh, breaking through to the entirety of like how it would actually work. Mm-hmm. Also, this looks like one of the points that you had on the show notes of the solution to the Chinese room problem. What is the Chinese yes, room problem? Yes, exactly. So <laughs> the Chinese room problem, uh, definitely important to talk about here. So it's it's this thought experiment where say you've got a, a room, right? A closed room. Nobody can get in or out. There's a person in that room and they are surrounded by, you know, this entire like library's worth of instructions on how to like translate into like small bits of Chinese into English. Right. And and how to like um, how, how to respond to things. Um, and so that they're like through a little slit in the door, right? They're past these slips of paper that have Chinese written on them. And their task is to write down like the answers to those those questions in Chinese. The person, again, does not understand Chinese. Um, they, you know, they're just following the instructions that, that, you know, are in the library around them in order to provide the correct answers to those to those questions, right? They, so they write down the answers in Chinese and then they, they slide them back out. Um, and so the idea here is that outside of the room, uh, you know, they're doing a Turing test on that on the room, right, to see if the room is is conscious, to see if the room knows Chinese. Um, and so the the person who created this thought experiment, I forget what his name was, but he said like, okay, there's clearly no real intelligence here. There's like no part of this system understands Chinese. Um, and so, like that, like that—that that was their argument for. Even though a machine may seem like it's intelligent, and you know, like can pass a Turing test, that doesn't mean that it's actually conscious. Um, but what what they're kind of missing there is that even though, like, the the focus of the thought experiment is on the person who's in there, right? The person does not understand Chinese. But yes. when you take the system as a whole, it understands Chinese. Right. 
if the system mm-hmm. as a whole knows how to answer any question in Chinese convincingly and seem like a person, you know, then that system has intelligence. So the person who's inside there is essentially just like serving as a single neuron in a brain. Hmm. And that's the Chinese room thought experiment. But yeah, so I mean, that ties right back into what we were talking about of like the sort of the, the computer consciousness as a whole entity, the society mm-hmm. that is a consciousness where each individual part doesn't necessarily understand what's going on in, as entirely, but together they make up an entire conscious society organism. We might have to invent a new word for it in the future thing. Yeah. Well, that's kind of how society is now. Not every single person in society knows exactly what the next person down the road is thinking, but we all work together to create um, industry, create commerce. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's kind of what we have now. Like we have all these individual moving parts, but they all come together and create cities and um technology and and wonders and art it's a it's it's a miracle that the three of us are able to talk to each other right now via you know a hangouts uh video call i don't understand how it works i I don't either um i'm actually in ian's basement he doesn't know what wait which (sighs) ian (laughs) (laughs) that's why i said it so i would freak you both out So this is bringing up another point that, you know, when when we have these technologies that we're developing, they are only available to, you know, the the wealthy few who can actually afford it, right? And it, the flu. Uh, at, yeah, at first and it, at and it, least. Yeah, and then it takes a little while, but then, you know, it it's like it gets it gets distributed to everybody. There's a, uh, there's a quote that I love. Um the future's already here. It's just not distributed evenly yet. And so the question here is like, will the singularity lessen that divide, right? Will it will it bring us all to kind of an even playing field or will it widen that divide or will it do nothing? <laughs> Just think about how humanity is mm-hmm. like we always want to be better than our neighbor. Like we always want to one up our neighbor. We always want to one up the country next to us. We, we want to be better. Like that's what drives like us forward is the drive to be better, to make more money to. So of course there's going to be like somebody who, who wants exclusive access to something that somebody else doesn't have access to. I think that's just built into our DNA that. And so we'd almost have to go through and delete that part of us that, that selfish nature of in us, we'd almost have to like release that. Well, I'm not sure if we necessarily need to make something that can release it as opposed to something that can just override it. Like this can tie back into that collective consciousness thing where it's, and also the idea of the technology is able to provide for all of us where we no longer get to make the decisions as opposed or for what is ours necessarily. Well, because it, people are different. Everybody's different. Like intelligences are different. Like some people have a higher IQ. Some people have like a higher drive. Some, there's athletes out there that are way better at like this than other people. Like there's, there's a diversity. And when there's such a diverse population, like, there's going to be people that are going to succeed better than other people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, as long as there's diversity and as long as there's differences, like uh, there's going to be, I guess I'd hate to say winners and losers, but um, how do we get away from that in the singularity? You know, if we've created this technology that is like better than, than we are in every way and can augment yeah. us in any way, then like, everybody would have the same opportunities to be augmented to the same level, you know? That's that's true. And I'm kind of thinking, um, and this, this, this might be to our detriment, but I'm kind of thinking um, as we can uh, kind of like uh, go in to the actual DNA of a child before it's born and pick what like you want almost, like, because that's coming down the road. Like you can kind of like pick the features of your child, which is kind Design of a creepy idea, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, designer babies. That sounds like but, a good future episode. <laughs> but the, yeah, I could see us the, either like removing flaws or removing things we don't like from ourselves that way or by augmenting us to equality. 
Um, I could see either route. But the thing is, is is that good? Because I feel like individuality is is good. Like w- when certain things like that that make us different make us better. So um, we all like contribute in a in our unique ways. And if we're all the same, then <laughs> we we can uh, lose out on something. Like, well, you're assuming that our contributions still have value at this point. Like with the technological singularity. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> we're we're at the point where. The technology is advancing faster than anything that we can really comprehend. So it's it's, I mean, from a simply, yeah, yeah. Um, pragmatical standpoint, we'll become we'll become obsolete. Yeah, we'll we'll be in a zoo somewhere, kind of. And and I think, um, like when we think about progress in all of its forms, you know, whether it's like technological progress, but also, um, you know, like evolution on a biological scale, right? All of the progress that we've made has come from the form of like, all right, a few different things, a few different solutions were were envisioned for this particular problem, right? One of them worked mm-hmm. better than the others. That's the one that succeeded. That's the one that that you know is the most likely to go on to, uh, you know, create the next form. And um, and so yeah, it's like if the the augmentations that are available to us right the the progress that the technology is making like like wh- what system is it going to use to come up with new you know like new improvements and and you know figure out which form of the improvement is best i don't know <laughs> yeah I, that's that's the part where we really can't grasp our minds around that that aspect of it we can just guess and throw darts at a wall and hopefully it goes in our favor. Uh, I think right now we hope our hope and prayer is that the singularity goes in our favor. Like we don't, we don't want it to go the other way. Right. So we're, we're taking a, a, a really kind approach to it. Like <laughs> we're being very kind to, to humanity in this approach. Yeah. Like uh, right now, technology is basically mother Teresa and uh, it's keeping us afloat. So do we want to talk about a few of those kind of doomsday scenarios, existential risks that the singularity could, you know, it, 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 like introduce um, ways for us to accidentally wipe ourselves out with this stuff with, uh, you know, in ways that we haven't been able to wipe ourselves out before. Yeah. So the the first thing that I want to say as we start this little section is that, like, it's very tempting to, like, f- hear about all of these these doomsday scenarios and be and and come to the conclusion that like we gotta we gotta like not let any of this happen. So we have to ban all of these technologies, right? Because they have the potential to do harm. Um, but in in many cases that's the riskiest scenario possible because if we like ban a particular technology then most people with good intentions will not be working on developing that technology right and so the only people who are developing that technology uh do not have our best best interests at heart right yeah like governments or like military um types of well, like yeah, or, or or fringe groups, you know, that are yeah, that are fringe groups. Uh, avoiding, yeah, the attention of the government the, that yeah, bans this thing. Yeah, the way technology is going, there's there's actually no real way to stop it. There's you can slow it down, but there's no way to completely stop it. Like there's always going to be somebody who finds a way to get past. Like think about it this way: there's uh, we have internet security, but our credit cards get hacked. Mm-hmm. We have the big the biggest uh keeper of, of our credit card information got hacked um and they they're supposed to be secure they're supposed to keep our information protected so we can't even protect our own data and so what's who are we to think that we can stop the singularity from happening cuz somebody out there you know like you said nefarious or otherwise is going to come up with like some breakthrough mm-hmm. so So, so yeah, one 
doomsday scenario is uh, the gray goo scenario where you've got um, a bunch of <laughs> gray goo. Yeah. So so the idea is um, if if you've ever seen uh, Stargate, right? Um, that's that was one of the main tv shows that i grew up with uh they had the replicators was one of the uh alien races that they encountered and the replicators are literally just like these these machines um they're made up of these little building blocks right that are like i don't know maybe an inch square um and these building blocks you know form together to make whatever type of machine they need to make and their only goal is to just make more of themselves right and uh, and so gray goo is kind of that same concept um usually though we think of gray goo as like a nanite you know type of thing where it's it's teeny tiny on the like 50 nanometers or smaller scale and so if 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 that type of technology uh you know decides like all right my goal here is to just make more of myself and that's all that I'm going to do. Yeah, like how do we stop something like that? If it, if it spreads at an exponential rate, which is, you know, it probably would because uh, you know, if if that's all that it's doing is, you know, making more of itself then um we have created the ultimate virus. Best case <laughs> best case scenario is it would take a couple of weeks for it to like consume the world. These are like little nanobots. Yep. Yep. Well, well, the thing is, is um, t- to grow, they would need some sort of resource, and I'm not sure. Yeah, all of the matter that they're encountering is their resource. Yeah, I think that's probably one of the most unlikely scenarios, just because. So I don't, I don't think it's that unlikely because if you think about it, we are gray goo. I guess. Y- you know, we are a self-replicating uh, nanite that evolved over time to you know kind of create many of these nanites that group together and formed entities that we understand to be you know organisms human beings one of them um and uh i mean obviously we have not like consumed the earth but we've we've done a darn good job of making it way different than it used to be when we started you know um and if these you know if these nanites are created uh to be like much much more durable than any organic like based gray goo that uh, that exists then um the only way that we would be able to stop this is to create well, I mean, another another nanite that, that could like you know the battle it yeah, yeah exactly well, like an immune system essentially but there's not unlimited r- resources for like what 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 resources would a nanite even use? Oh yeah, like, I don't know what materials they would be made of. Um, well, I mean that because in a desert, <laughs> it would have to um, figure out ways to get around. Um, cert because there every single <laughs> area on Earth is not going to have the same elements and same right yeah same ma- makeup. So um, yeah, we'll just move into a place where it's just we'll we'll get on a boat and just live on the ocean. Or something. I don't know. I don't know. Water seems like it would be a pretty good resource because it's got yeah. So well, yeah. it doesn't have carbon. Carbon's a really a really good atom to use. And then what would happen if there was a nanite that somehow the ability to recognize other nanites was passed down, so it was <laughs> started destroying, <laughs> counter destroying the the other nanites, and so it just sort of became this self ball of self replicating, self destroying. <laughs> Matter. Yeah, what if one nanite just wanted to be a star and better than the other nanite? I think what you're describing is an ecosystem yeah. now. Yeah, <laughs> nanite ecosystem, like a contained nanite eco- ecosystem. Yeah, I mean, in some ways it makes sense because you're right, man, I guess, did come from like that, but uh, it, it's hard to wrap your mind around a small, like something the size of an ant or a little bit bigger than an ant having that much like intelligence you know what i mean yeah it, it, well and that's the thing is like if if we create because we we definitely want to create nanotechnology for all of its potentials right it is one of the best tools that we have for extending our own lifetimes of augmenting our you know bodies and and each of those individual nanites 
isn't going to be able to house a whole lot of intelligence on its own, right? Yeah. How will it be able to, you know, because if it needs to, like, repair itself, right? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It's probably advantageous for us to create a version of this nanite that can repair itself so that it doesn't, so it's, you know, break down. How does it know which resources around it are fair game that it can use, um, you know, if it's if it's living in a human body, for example? Um if it gets yeah, a, if it gets out of the human yeah. body and goes into some other environment, right? Will it be able to gracefully recognize that and adjust its uh, behavior appropriately? I don't know. So I guess that that would I guess n- mean that they would be able to be interconnected and use like a uh, hyper intelligence kind of like where yeah their connect minds to each other be, yeah yeah their minds would be one um, almost. Um, yeah, I feel like there's ways we could defeat it, like using some sort of ingenuity. But um, yeah, that's a scary idea because it'd probably consume us to get like uh, fuel and consume us to get resources. So um, imagine getting eaten alive by like uh, vicious ants. And even if we don't think it's likely that we would accidentally create a nanite that, you know, would end up with some runaway you know scenario like this we can't be guaranteed that nobody else would try to develop one for nefarious purposes right so we definitely would want to create you know like we we would want people on the job uh to like you know make defenses against this type of thing yeah i think that the best bet would be to develop some sort of technology along with it to kind of like as a countermeasure Mm -hmm. um on the other hand we don't really have countermeasures currently for the existential crises that we face in today's world uh for example nuclear armaments right if if you uh, know bunker well (laughs) that's not that's not going to protect you from the ongoing fallout and you know breakdown of like all of the infrastructure in the world all of the (laughs) ecosystems yeah oof yeah i'm i'm almost more scared of the situation that we're in right now than i am of future possible existential risks i i mean i am only more scared of it because I do not trust humans to make good decisions. So until <laughs> the decision making is out of our hands, I will not feel safe. Isn't this the theme of this, the episode so far is humans make terrible decisions? Kind of. <laughs> <laughs> but but as we've been talking about groups of humans, right? You know, 7 billion humans together, hopefully we're making reasonable decisions, right? Uh, as As a collective. Yeah. yeah. Just depends on when we actually reach the point of singularity. If we're, if we have good people in power, bad people in power, like where we're at, at like if we go into singularity where we have things figured out already, uh, for the most part, then that's probably the best uh, bet. But if we go into the singularity now, where everything's kind of a mess, oh, we're and we have like warring country, like we're almost in another cold war with China and Russia mm-hmm. and. Um, we're all developing supercomputers. We're all like trying to one up each other. I think they turned on something where they pulled half the world's internet traffic through China because um, the internet flows through the path of uh, <laughs> least exist- mm. uh, mm-hmm. resistance, I guess. Um, so it was faster to go through China than anywhere else. And so when they booted this up, uh, all the traffic went through China, like uh, a good majority of it. Um, so these countries right now are, they're trying to, you know, get better technology wise. And the big difference between right now and the cold war, I would say is the, the fact that we are like intrinsically economically tied to China. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, they're like, yeah, yeah. Neither, neither the United States nor China would really be able to function without the other. Yeah. I'm, I'm kind of happy that we've come to the point where we've developed enough that we have to rely on each other Mm -hmm. and we realize that we're starting to realize that we it's almost we're getting close to a world i think we are in a world economy but definitely Mm -hmm. there's winners and losers right now and i think as we get closer to a more even playing field that'll be nice 
uh, for some of these smaller countries. And probably not the best time to go into the singularity. We probably want to get our stuff figured out a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think that where, where mankind's at at the time of singularity is going to probably help define the path we're going to go down. Right? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Another kind of existential risk is, uh, of course, that like any, like any AI that we develop, right? How do we know whether it's going to be friendly to us or not? Um, and one comfort that I take for this scenario is that if we develop an AI, it, it would definitely be in our best interest to kind of test it out first, to emulate that AI before we put it into like, you know, an actual live environment where it can, you know, interact with the world. Um, and it would be pretty easy to, you know, simulate an AI type thing, right? Because, it, you know, it is an artificial intelligence. It exists on a computer, so we can just run yeah. it on the computers that we have at that time, right? Um, and so because of that, like... We, we make we make so much currently of of the whole are we in a simulation how will we know yada yada stuff but like at the same time any ai that we create will also have to wonder am i in a simulation am i being tested right do is there somebody watching and you know if i <laughs> if i kill everybody that's around me then will they shut down the simulation and not let you know create me because like I Buck, didn't where, behave. Where, Buck, where will you test this out or where will the personality learn? Because I remember last year they turned it on for like one day. I think it was Microsoft or maybe it was Facebook. It was a bot and it was supposed to learn from everybody on the internet. And within a day, uh, this bot was already corrupted and cursing and <laughs> doing all sorts of nefarious things and they just shut the whole project down yeah and and so the the i think the difference there is that we do not currently have the level of technology necessary to simulate the environment around the ai you know yeah wouldn't, um, wouldn't you want the ai to learn in like a how, how would you like yeah how would you want the ai to learn like how do we set that up like um, well, so that sounds like a topic for the future jam half oh, of true. this episode yeah. where we, we, yeah, we can definitely delve into some of the methods of developing artificial intelligence. Oh, oh yeah. What, um, so as, uh, this develops, uh, how, how will this AI like affect us negatively if it goes bad? Uh, in that, well, in that scenario, um, I'm just, th I was referring to a way for us to mitigate that risk, you know, um, <laughs> okay. like, is, uh, is testing it first. Yeah. Um, mm. And even if we don't test it first, right, uh, like the AI would have to wonder, even though it's in the real world, how does it know that it's in the real world? You know, does it like it can't guarantee to itself that it is not in a simulation. Um, so this is kind of like a reverse Rocco's Basilisk. Um, You're also which assuming that it has uh, the value of self-preservation. True. Yes. Wow, that's a profound point. Uh, uh. <laughs> his mind just, he just blew his mind with that one idea. Well, I was, I was going to say that um, any AI that we create that does not have self-preservation as a goal is not likely to last very long. But then I realized that does not also guarantee that we will last very long, right? It could take all of us out along with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we, if we take out the self-preservation thing, then uh, it won't worry about preserving us either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Oh, boy. Yeah, it's a, it's a conundrum a, a little bit. Um, because anytime, uh, how society almost works now is the intel, like the higher IQ, higher, um, I, I don't want to even put it that way, but like people who are like more educated somehow run everything, you know, and then they stay at that top level because they have the money and resources to keep their, 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 uh, ancestors educated. So, um, once the art, once once uh technology gets to the point where it can keep it, it keeps growing and growing and growing past us, um, it it's not gonna, it's going to see us as a lower class, and 
it's kind of just like uh it like it, it's when it when the, when it comes to resources it, if it needs the resources over us it's going to take those resources mm-hmm. sure yeah right and it that isn't even necessarily due to like a selfish reason it could no. just it, you know it, it could just cut boil down to well i need these resources for you know some higher goal that it's doing right like i don't know terra like terraforming mars or you know something crazy like that um whereas like the humans want this resource to you know fund their uh you know football stadium project or something like that right like it it's going to prioritize the the goals that it thinks are more worthy well we Uh, already we already do that though like we like if our crops are being messed with by insects, we kill the insects. Mm-hmm. If there's wild boars running around and destroying our food, we will get in a helicopter and shoot those wild boars from a helicopter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like we we already do this. And so if technology learns from us, they're going to see it's, it's just go to YouTube and type in wild boar hunting from from a helicopter, and you can see that we are preserving ourselves by killing other things. I was just thinking, we're so we're assuming that the technological singularity will be this big event. What if it's just a complete and total flop because the, the, <laughs> the technology just decides, I don't want to do anything? I'm bored. Like, what we're saying is we are able to design a computer that's able to design the next computer better, but we're also assuming that it's going to continue wanting to do things. That's a that's a good point. Like, uh, what what will the computer want to do? Like, will it want to in- entertain itself, or will it want to continue learning? Like, will it have the capacity will, to? <laughs> we'll have, to the yeah, we'll have the well, capacity to. Yeah, I think it would have to have the capacity oh, yeah. for learning in order to be able to design, you know, and like any next system better than we can design another one. Yeah. And I would also say that if an AI is created that just doesn't want to do anything, uh, then the creators of that AI are probably just going to unplug it because it's like, well, this was useless. Uh, let's go back to the drawing board. Well, uh, yeah. How, how is the the our new leaders uh, going to treat people who don't want to do anything? Like that that group of people that are like, because we feed them and we we support that group of people in our society that doesn't want to do anything or isn't capable how is like we have like that sense of responsibility and we have that sense of justice but will like the computers like care (laughs) at all yeah so so here's here's how i am thinking about this right now right our sense of morality is very human centric right we believe in like the the sanctity of each human life and and so you know any action that that goes to harm another human we consider to be like okay that is morally wrong we don't really consider it morally wrong to harm right insects that are eating our crops other you know we certainly don't have any problem with like wiping out you know the viruses and bacteria that are harming people we you know like even though there are probably other animals that are probably conscious, right? You know, it, like it's pretty hard to know whether or not uh, a lot of other apes, right? Other like dolphins, um, maybe even you know like dogs or something like that, right? Are like it's it's hard to say whether they are conscious or not. But we really don't have much. Like we 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 do not afford them the same level of priority in our ethical, you know conceptions as we afford to other humans so in a post singularity world you know if we have unaugmented humans still walking around in addition to you know these like more like capable uh augmented humans or you know machine entities that that you know are like orders of magnitude smarter than us and more capable than us right will like i don't think like if they if they use the same model as we do they will not think there's anything morally wrong with harming humans if that you know like is the best thing for them but at the same time i'm like is that bad you know if like 
my my goal for the universe I'm thinking really really big here. My goal yeah. for the universe is to increase complexity throughout the universe, right? I I want like like our 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 abilities, our computations to like, you know, just grow and grow and grow in terms of of, you know, the possibilities. And if I get in the way of that, right? If if uh you know if I refuse to be like upgraded or you know like augmented um and and if like my the resources that I'm using up would be better you know if I'm harming you know some some like entity that is more able than me should I as Ian Buck be allowed to continue to exist and you know most of us humans think like take that thinking and go like our, our, our self-preservation kicks in. Right. Mm-hmm. But I'm almost inclined to say like, go ahead. If you don't need me, like just get rid of me <laughs> for the greater good. If, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess maybe, okay. What's the closest thing to um, us right now? I guess you would say Nape or um, probably. Yeah. Yeah, so we treat treat those differently than we treat ourselves. Like, I mean, than we treat other animals. Like uh, we have some sort of level of regard, I guess. <laughs> like uh, the the when they get closer to us, we um, give them yeah, more but respect. We'll still shoot a gorilla dead if there's a human child's life on the line. We have demonstrated that. <laughs> uh, Harambe. Even when there wasn't an actual threat, when it was just a perceived threat, we still shot it dead. Yeah, that that was <laughs> that was the biggest thing that happened in Cincinnati. Uh, Harambe. It's yeah, it's it's a really really challenging, you know, and, and I'm not sure that my answers are the correct answers. Like I guess I, to move forward, we have to kind of offer ourselves up as sacrifice, possibly for the greater good. For the greater good. And is is this the greater good? For the greater good. <laughs> Is this the, is this the greater good? Like what? Why why do we even need this? <laughs> now now I you know I say that okay I'm okay with with you know be like getting killed if that if if that's for the greater good. But at the same time, that's not my plan A, right? <laughs> my my plan A is to number one live long enough to see the singularity, right? So I'm gonna take care of myself and you know stay healthy and everything. Um, Number two, augment myself, you know, allow myself to become part of this system if that is at all possible uh, so that, you know, I don't get left behind partially because, (laughs) yeah, like partially out of self-preservation just, you know, because like if I am more useful to this system, then I, you know, can continue to exist. But also like, dang, I really want to experience some of that crazy stuff that's coming down the line at us, you know? He's going to be the first one to upload himself to the internet. Oh man, I think that I have uh, just about exhausted my high level, you know, crazy thinking for the week. <laughs> How about you guys? You guys got anything else pressing on your minds about the singularity? No, I, I can't think of anything. How about you, Decker? I mean, I have one thing, but I'm not sure if I necessarily want to go down that rabbit hole right now because that'll probably uh. take us another half hour. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this has been uh, a pretty long episode, but that's not a surprise when uh, when it is as big as the technological singularity. Um, yeah. We didn't even touch the iceberg. One of the one of the things that I love about this um, subject is that it has so many moving parts, right? That it like it has tied into several of the episodes that we have from the past for the extra dimension, right? We talked about like um, post-scarcity. We talked about uh, directed panspermia. We talked about, you know, like um, uh, the end of ownership, right? The access economies kind of ties into this a little bit, but also like there's, there's so many future episodes in the little pieces of what we talked about, right? Like I could do, I, I could do not only, an entire episode about existential risks i could probably do an entire series about existential risks and dedicate one episode to each one of them you know my whole question the one that i was thinking about was the existential risks of like assuming that we want to keep our identity as humans how much of us can be replaced while still keeping us us oh dear (laughs) oh yeah and like what what is the essential quality of being human yes yeah that's like its own episode. Uh-huh. 
And and I mean we did uh, we did cover a, a fair amount of that when we were talking about consciousness itself, right? Because yeah. um, I would say, yeah, I I would argue that consciousness is the essential quality of being human. You know, like I can augment my bo- body as much as I want, and you know, you would still call me a human. I mean, you don't say what I'm gonna call you. <laughs> it <laughs> I might call you Robo Boy. It would be very rude for you to that. <laughs> that's our word. <laughs> oh boy, you Augie. But <laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> Augie. But uh, but yeah, it's it's. My brain can't even keep up with this anymore. Yeah, I think he. It's, I think he is a robot, and he might have malfunctioned. <laughs> Somebody go over there and reboot him. Error. error. Somebody reboot. It's, I do. Okay, I do need a reboot. That's called sleeping overnight. Turn it on and off again. Since we. Since I think that's uh, that's all we have to talk about for the day. Uh, thanks for listening, everybody, to this. Uh, rather long episode and uh and remember there's a whole nother episode on the future jam to go and check out if you would like to give us feedback on this episode uh you can email us at the nexus tv at gmail.com uh or hit us up on twitter at the, t- the nexus tv the extra dimension is released under a creative commons attribution license so if you want to use any part of this episode uh, feel free to do that and uh, remember that all of our show notes with, uh, you know, further reading, links to other stuff uh, can all be found at the, the nexus.tv slash TED31. Decker, where can people find you on the Internet? I mean, I don't really have too much of an Internet presence. I am on Twitter on occasionally. So if you want to shout out to me at Bigfoot1138, I'm on there. Otherwise, if it's you just... real. Yeah. I wonder where that 1138 came from. Mm, I have too much influence on my friends sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, if you have a really good question for me and that's not working for you, just bug the guys at the Nexus. They know how to get a hold of me. Mm-hmm. And Mike, where can people find you on the internet? Uh, you can find the show at the Future Jam on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. And you can find me at the Cinemike on uh, Twitter. That's my personal account. Nice. And uh, I have been Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck. Or uh, if you want to see links to other stuff that I create, you can go to ianrbuck.com. Once again, thanks for listening, everybody. Have a good one. <laughs>